Two million refugees have fled Ukraine since the Russian invasion began, with many facing these extremely long, cold, bitterly cold queues at border crossings. British student Corinne Skye, who was studying medicine in Ukraine, spent three days trying to escape the country. Once she reached the front of the queue, though, she was subjected to racist abuse and forced to join a slower queue with other non-white people. It's a story that keeps coming up, actually. And Corinne joins us uh, now. She's back in the UK. You've been back since Thursday, I think, yeah. haven't you? And you've brought along with you uh, a barrister, Patricia Daly, who is also helping uh, other students to leave. You've been raising money, haven't you, to, to help them through. Um, Corinne, just to explain, um, you, you're a British citizen, but you chose to study in Ukraine. Just explain why, because I think viewers will be thinking, why did you go to Ukraine okay. in the first place? Yes, yeah, so my lifelong dream has always been to be a doctor. So when I found out that I was actually way more affordable to study in Ukraine, um, I opted to go to Ukraine. Like, the um, school fees in this country are extortionate, mm. along with the cost of living. So um, the opportunity to study somewhere else more affordably and also, like, learn a different culture was really appealing to me. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, you, you've had a good time in general since you... How long have you been in Ukraine studying? Um, I'd been in Ukraine for almost a year this time. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was an amazing time. I was really, like, building a community. There's a large community of international students. So I, I had, like, a community of people from all over the world. Yeah. So I really, like, was enjoying that part of it. And so explain what happened when, obviously, as with two million other people, mm -hmm. um, students in particular were trying to get out um, where did you go? How did you get there? And what was the experience that you had? OK, so originally our plan was to go to Poland. So I set up some um, Telegram chats so that our students could communicate with one another. Telegram, and... just in case people at home are watching, it's a platform, it's like a social media platform. It's called Telegram. It's not necessarily used by lots of people, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a really good way of communicating. Sort of yes, like that, right? um, it allows you to have, like, large groups of people in one place. Um, and in Eastern Europe, that's generally the way of communicating. So we were all in these um, group chats trying to, like, find out how to get out of Ukraine. Mm. And when the war broke out, information dissemination was really slow. Mm. Things were changing by the minute. So being in those um, groups, we could um, keep like, up to date with what was going on. So um, we left the Dnipro uh, the day after Kiev was bombed, um, when the air siren started going off, and we headed to Lviv. Lviv is in um, western Ukraine. It's like the closest place in Ukraine to the borders. So um, on our way there, like, we saw armed police officers, there was, like, military everywhere, and we had to go through several military checkpoints. Um, and that was really scary, because I know, like, during a war, military checkpoints are targeted, so every time we had to stop and have our car checked and show our documents, it was so, so scary. Um, once we finally reached Lviv, it was supposed to be, um, I think, like, a 10-hour drive, but it took 24 hours. Mm. When we got to Lviv, um, I was coordinating with Patricia, the students within the um, group chats. And once we got there, there were um, several students who were looking for accommodation. So people were stopping over in Lviv before they headed off to their borders. So um, we checked the students into um, hostels. So in the hostels, the girls were now reporting um, incidences of racism. Um, when they were trying to leave Ukraine, and some of the students had already reached the Polish border. So our original aim was to go to Poland. Mm. But after all those, like, reports, I thought, you know, this is the last thing we want to be dealing with, mm. so let's aim to go to Romania. So we left to go to Romania. Um, on the way to Romania, we were stopped by um, armed civilians who, like, took out a gun on us and told us that if you don't leave now, we'll shoot. And then when we finally got to um, the back of the queue, so it was nine kilometres from the Romanian border, that's when we ended up spending, um, I think it was two days in the car queue. So the queue to get over the border was nine kilometres? It was nine kilometres, so but that we was spent two days. Two days to get to the border, so to get to the front of the queue. To get to the front of the queue. And it's like, if you imagine, like, a motorway, there's no shops, there's nothing. And we just had the snacks that we'd carried and the clothes on our back. And just to be clear, were you, were you and native Ukrainians, and in this case, I suppose you would say white, because mm. you're talking about them picking you out of the queue, 
Were you all in the same queue? So this is um, the part I want to be like explicit about, right? In the car queue, there was um, Ukrainian people and there were, um, I didn't see any other black people in the car queue, but there was just mainly Ukrainian people. So once we got to the front of the queue, we were told to exit the car queue by um, a civilian, a male civilian told us to exit the car queue. So I came out of the car to speak to the military because I thought um, the military are there to, you know, to support the civilians because I didn't understand why we were being told to leave the car queue. The military told us to leave the car queue, so we took the car out of the car queue and we waited to see if um, the situation could be resolved. Did they uh, say why they wanted you to leave the queue? They didn't say why. So I thought it was to de-escalate the situation. So once we left the car queue, um, a man went and started circling the car and pointing to the... A pedestrian queue. Now, the oh. pedestrian queue was just as long, but it was just non-white Ukrainian people. So I was confused as to why we're being told, once we've reached a queue that we've been yeah. in for two days, why we're now being told to join a further... There were no Ukrainian people in that queue. And they couldn't explain to you why they were doing it? I no. think, you know, the yeah. Ukrainian ambassador was speaking at the Home Affairs Select Committee and he confirmed that he's aware of, of some of the issues that have problems have arisen. As he says, when foreigners appear to be prioritised for evacuation, it's been raised many times, Ukraine is a very homogenic society, not many people with different races on the streets. Foreigners do stick out of the crowd. It doesn't mean we are racist, is what he says. We don't want it to happen. Problems arise when foreigners are prioritised over women and children of Ukrainian citizens who are trying to get on the same trains or trying to get through the borders. Of course, you're a woman. I'm a woman, so that was my argument. Because even when the man was cycling the car, he tried to lunch with me, and the military at no point intervened, which I found very, very odd. And so the queue for, for the non-white refugees, essentially, mm -hmm. fleeing war, was much, much longer than the mm -hmm. car queue, and you were on foot, and mm -hmm. it's freezing cold. And it's freezing cold. And so, you're, I mean, and Patricia, you're here, obviously, because you... This is... Corinne's story and eventually you got through but you didn't want to make a fuss because you just wanted to keep going didn't you mm. but you were documenting it as you were going because yeah. you knew then that you were experiencing racism yes and this was from the Ukrainians who were managing the border not the Romanians or the Poles no. as you were saying Patricia what is the widespread concern and what is the ex is that experience very common that you're finding in all the people that you're trying to help who are still trying to leave? Yeah, um, from very early on, the students were complaining that certain borders were not allowing them to go through. They were being sent back um, into the Ukrainian cities where obviously they, there was bombing and there was shellings happening. Um, it was a common consensus with the students that they were experiencing racial discrimination when they were boarding trains, being asked to exit trains and also being told to wait last before boarding the trains until all the Ukrainian nationals had boarded. So it was a shared consensus and we had to almost work out which points to send the students in order to not waste their journey and make the journey worth travelling to mm. and make sure that they can get to safety. Absolutely disgraceful, really. That you, Corinne, had you, you experienced in anything, anything like this in the, the year and a half that you'd been in Ukraine at all? No, I never experienced that, but... I said before, um, I always assumed that, you know, Ukrainian people, they're very quiet. They're, it's, a, it's a different kind of culture in Ukraine, so I never attributed it to racism. I just thought that it's a different culture, so I'm not going to say, oh, you know. And also, there's the language barrier. As majority of people, they speak Ukrainian or Russian. So I just assumed that, oh, you know, they're not really going to speak to foreigners because there's that language barrier. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I suppose the key aim is just to get people out, isn't it? The students who are there. Uh, we know from when, you know, in, in peaceful times, when footballers play anywhere in Eastern Europe, the stories of, uh, you know, uh, of can be racism is, is huge in that part of the world. And I'm very sorry that you have that experience, but it's really important we carry on telling these stories because this is obviously something that isn't going to go away whilst there are many, many black and foreign students trying to leave a war zone. Um, so thank you for coming in and we're glad you're safe and home and we hope that, Patricia, you're, you're raising money to try and help other students leave, aren't you? Uh, and good luck with that. Thank you so much thank for, for you. coming thank in. Thank you so much. Um, now, we have some breaking news for you. Uh, the Deputy Mayor of Maripol, Sergei Orlov, has confirmed that um, 17 were injured and three were killed, including one young girl in Maripol, after... Uh, that awful, horrific mm. bombing of a maternity 
hospital uh, yesterday. Yeah, those extraordinary graphic images that we've been showing you since that bombing of that, that, that children's hospital. Um, Sergei Orlov will be joining us. He's the deputy mayor of Mariupol. He's going to be joining us and he can explain exactly what they are going through there in Mariupol. It seems like it's a, a city under a real siege. Is that a country, Corinne, that you, is that part of the country that you had visited, Mariupol? No, I've just been to Kiev, Lviv, Dnipro, um, Kharkov, uh, Zap. Yeah. So plenty of lovely parts of the country yeah. back then, of course. Yeah. Will you go back eventually if the opportunity arises? What, I mean, do you know what's going to happen? Well, um, when we left my apartment, we just abandoned every, everything. So I thought maybe I'd go back and, you know, collect my things mm -hmm. or try and continue my education. But so far, um, our university is close to further yes, notice. Of course. There's not really yes. any guidance on what we're supposed well, to do next. Be, I guess they've got other priorities the right now. Are, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry that your education itself has been stopped, but at least you're safe and yeah. uh, back here. Patricia Thank you Karin. so much. Thank you for yeah.